As a way of introduction, uh, I'm Gotham Rao. I'm the Chair of Family Medicine and Community Health at Case Western Reserve University and University Hospitals of Cleveland, uh, as well as my title is Chief Clinician Experience Officer for the University Hospitals Health System, which most places call it Chief Wellness Officer. What we found was that physicians really hate the word wellness, so we changed it. Um, it wasn't my idea. I think it works pretty well. Uh, I'm also, uh, I run uh, board certified both family medicine and obesity medicine, and I run a medical obesity program for adults now. I used to be the director of the pediatric program at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh for many years. And I'm the former chair of the American Heart Association's Obesity Committee and serve on the National Academy of Medicine's Obesity Committee. And I, this topic kind of grew out organically for a number of reasons. And I know I, I know Tracy was part of our presentation in uh, July, Tracy, something like that. Um, um, so I'm going to go through some basics here. So I think everybody family physician or not comes to the same place. If you're passionate about preventing heart disease, which I am, and I have always been, you say, well, I've got to prevent risk factors for heart disease. And what are those? Well, they're the traditional ones, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. Can't do much about um, family history. Smoking cessation, of course, is important for those who smoke. And then you go a step backwards and say, well, what drives some of those risk factors? And of course, it's body weight and obesity. And then you say to yourself, well, when do I prevent this? And the best time is, of course, as the early, at, the, at the time of conception is what I say, but if you can't as early as possible is a critical thing. So um, in 2000, uh, the years have gone by so fast I've forgotten. I think it was 2004 I wrote a popular book for parents. And in doing some research around it, I started to look at old school photos from, and just pause for a second, I did not expect the <laughs> influx. <laughs> Well, word got out. Don't so apparently, word. or maybe it's for the next speaker. Maybe they're just hanging out. Um, yeah, there's a whole group out there. We didn't know that it started because the door was closed. Oh, okay. Go on in. house now so um, I'll just back up just a little bit and I say in doing research for that book I started to look at old school photos from the 1930s from one elementary school in Florida and these are not hard to find um, you can find them on, on the internet which is what I did very very easy to find they go year by year by year. So I looked at the pictures from the 1930s. Any guesses as to how many children with obesity I saw in the pictures from the 1930s? Zero. 1940s? Zero. 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 50s? Zero. 60s? Zero. 70s? One, maybe two. I mean, obviously. You don't want to label children that way, but obviously having obesity. 80s, which is when I was a, a, a school kid. One, two, 90s. One to 2,000, a third. More recently, in the last 20 years, the majority. What happened? So I did the same thing in preparing this talk and in this initiative as well. Um, so first of all, let me talk about the leadership team for this initiative. Um, I think I've introduced myself already. Uh, Dr. Powell Wiley cannot be here today. The reason is NIH is prohibiting um, out of town travel for conferences. Otherwise, she would love to be here as well. And she's not available virtually either. James Werner is the behavioral psychologist for our program, and um, he is not able to be here either. So, a picture tells a thousand words. So, I did the same thing looking at young African American women graduating from a secretarial school in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Any guess as to what year this is? 60s, yeah. 1960, exactly. Nobody. Not one. So people say there were probably a lot fewer people with obesity back then. No, 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 that's not the answer. There weren't any. Okay? This is from Alabama. 70s. Maybe one. 80s. A couple. 90s. A couple more. Recently. Any guesses? Majority. The majority. Okay. What happened? So that's part of the, the effort behind this initiative. It's not genetic. Can't be, right? Genes don't change that fast. What is going on 
And that is the, um, the question that we're trying to address here. Same sort of pictures. I, I, I've got hundreds of pictures, from many from Pittsburgh, actually. So uh, we um, are talking about a group or subpopulation that suffers disproportionately from this problem. The reason is a very practical one. And we didn't expect this when we started a medical obesity program in Northeast Ohio that serves the entire region. Okay, um, and that means rural areas, urban areas, upper middle class. 80% of our clients are African American women. Uh, and they are highly motivated, highly seeking help. Okay, so that kind of dispels one myth that this is something that some people don't take seriously. And of course, this is the population with one of the highest rates of obesity. Um, Overall, this is just a general statistic. And here's some interesting things for you. These are some major racial ethnic groups. Non-Hispanic white, black, Asian, and Hispanic men and women. I think one of the most interesting things to me, non-Hispanic black men, non-Hispanic white men are almost exactly the same. Probably. Actually, black men is lower. Okay? There are no significant differences among men of different racial and ethnic groups. So you start to say, so, well, genetics, probably not. From my understanding, African American men live in African American communities as well, right? Environmental, maybe, but it's, there's still something missing here. So then we start to think about what is the weight loss experience of people who are trying to lose weight and participate in studies. Some of you may have heard of this look-ahead trial. It's mostly a research study. And basically, it's an intensive lifestyle intervention for people with overweight and obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, it's remarkable they were able to recruit 42% male. In our clinical program, we have six men total. We have hundreds of women. Six men. A couple of them don't show up very often. Um, the others come with their spouse. Okay, so it gives you an idea of how little interest, so they did very well. They are looking at the average weight loss. Here's something else. They looked at who was able to keep the weight off. Sustained in eight years in non-Hispanic whites and minority women, including African-American women and Latino women as well. Not minority men, that, that's average. So here's another myth that we know that you know lead something that's not true african-american women cannot lose weight and keep it off that's not true they're able to do it so session attendance and engagement was very high uh, daily self-weighing is the most important thing that anyone can do who's trying to lose weight um, so we looked at who are the ones that were successful what's what are the themes that that resonated with them one is motivation they you know when i see a client come in and she's in tears not because, you know, most of our average client is 62 years old, by the way. These are not women who want to lose five pounds to look on the, good on the beach or who are going to a wedding. Um, they're coming to me because the surgeon says, I can't operate on you unless you lose 50 pounds. Or your pain is just going to be worse and worse. So when somebody comes to me with tears and says, I've got to lose weight. I just lost my mom to complications of type 2 diabetes and I'm 60 years old. I don't want to be like her. Those are the highly motivated people we care for. Opportunity, you have to reach out to these people, right? You have to actually give them a chance. And adaptability is the most important characteristic. So that is, I'm traveling to Pittsburgh today. Gosh, I don't know. There's going to be lots of very rich desserts available to me. I'm going to try to find some sort of alternative. And that applies to many aspects of life. Uh, weight loss maintenance, um, we are looking at cultural adaptations, um, which are helpful. The only one we found, which I, I cannot implement, is a faith-based type of thing, but that seems to be helpful for some subpopulation, not just African-American women, but tackling into spirituality is, is, is one approach to it. So this was our motivation. So we run the Fitter Me program. As I said, 80% of our clients are African-American women. And we brought together leading experts in the field, patients from our program, family physician leaders like Dr. Conti, um, to develop a summary statement which explains the higher prevalence of obesity and also the disparity in weight loss efforts success, which there is a significant disparity. We want to provide recommendations for family physicians, and let me underline family physicians. So I've been on every single 
Obesity Committee, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, National Academy of Medicine, and they are clueless about primary care. You know, if you ever see the AAP recommendations about exercise for, well, first of all, they say no television on, for children under age of, the age of two, right? How many of you have, well, how many of you have kids under the age of two? Okay. And uh, how many of you are, think that's a realistic recommendation? <laughs> okay. The other one that I voted against back, and this is going back, I don't know, 2008, 2009, was one hour of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise per day for a child. I said no. And my rationale was, if I tell a, a child and a family to exercise for an hour a day, I think they're going to do zero instead, right? It's going to be too much. Why don't we start with 30 to 60 minutes? They voted it down because they said, no, no, 60 minutes is what's been shown to improve metabolic profiles and, st and stamina. I said, gosh, you guys are on the wrong track. So we need to be at the table, and so this initiative is deliberately targeting family physicians exclusively and the patients that we care for. Um, we want to develop a framework to address some of the outstanding questions related to African American women and weight loss through a nationwide learning collaborative and use that collaborative to develop some research proposals. We started with four principal questions. What are the barriers to and facilitators of successful weight loss in this population? Starting the conversation, so my research deals a lot with um, communication around issues of weight, diabetes, and blood pressure. So what are culturally appropriate ways to begin weight loss discussions? What treatment strategies are most likely to be successful? And what else do we need to learn? And who do we learn it from? This is a list of our participants. I'm not going to go through it. I, I, I point this out. To give you an idea of the depth of expertise, Dr. Powell Wiley, um, this is her life, basically. Um, I, I, I have to say I feel humbled by a lot of these people. Uh, some of you may have heard of Dr. Kumanika. This is her life as well. Dr. Conti is here with us today. We have community leader, leaders, Reverend Patty Fears, uh, Mary Douglas Brown from Washington, D.C., our own Mr. Bauer. Uh, the patients we were able to recruit for this initiative are extremely high-functioning uh, people. We wanted some more middle-class or lower-income women. Unfortunately, we were not able to get them. Probably had to do a lot to do with COVID and engaging them at this point. But our two participants include uh, a, supreme, a superior court judge and someone who runs a not-for-profit that's worth millions and millions of dollars. Nevertheless, I think their input was valuable. Uh, the vast majority of these people, as, as you can imagine, are African American women. These are the 12 recommendations we came out with. We started off with a meeting about four or five hours, and then we went back to the participants and refined those recommendations over and over again until we came up with 12. This is not a controversial, that it's a serious problem, that it's multifactorial. Um, what it seems to be, looking at all the evidence, is there's nothing especially unique about African American women. It's because they are exposed to the factors that promote obesity more so than other people. Okay, obesity is rising in many, many parts of the world and many subpopulations. The exposure to those factors is much higher among African American women than it is among other groups. Okay? We can talk about those maybe. Countering the messages, there was a lot from, actually, I don't see Dr. Sugar here, and I don't know if he's here. His plane was canceled. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, but he was very passionate about the food industry, which we can talk about, trauma, chronic stress, poor sleep. So these are all the, the uh, conclusions and recommendations. One of the most interesting, so here's um, one of the insights you come from. So you think like you know a lot of stuff, but you don't until you speak to people who are actually affected. And one of the most in interesting insights to me was that the social supports that African American women have are not the same as they are for other people, okay? They are expected to be, they're household leaders, they often have children that they're looking after on their own. They're supposed to project strength, and they often don't have anyone to talk to about these issues at all. That's not the same for, for other groups whatsoever. Uh, we talked about community partnerships, improved understanding, and um, that there was a great deal of diversity among the population. Who's defined as African-American? Uh, 
men and women who recently immigrated from Africa, for example, have very low rates of obesity, and even in the second generation. So it's, 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 it's a complex phenomenon is what we learned. So the question was, where do we go from here, and what have we learned, and what do we want to do? We want all of you to join a collaborative to work on this together. And though we are still working on what that looks like, really means talking to your patients, not just African American women, but others as well who are affected by this problem, or perhaps not, or know someone who is, so that they can contribute knowledge. We don't need any more medical knowledge about it. We don't need to know about the risks of diabetes or what, whatsoever. We need to work towards solutions. Um, and we want to uh, assemble this into a toolkit specifically for family physicians and something to develop further collaborative research. Oh, sorry, can I go back? Yeah. So let me go, uh, touch upon a few major points because the, each of these recommendations has a couple of pages that accompany it here. How do you raise the issue of weight with your patients? So there is a standard approach. If you look at the National Academy of Medicine's book entitled The Challenge of Overweight, the Roundtable on Obesity, to which I was a contributor, my only contribution was how do you start the conversation? And others dealt with public policy, coverage for laboratory testing, all kinds of things in there. But here's what I've recommended for 20 plus years when you talk to a patient. I'm concerned about your weight. It is putting you at risk for diabetes, pick your medical illnesses, hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. Is this something that concerns you as well? Is this something that you and I can work on together? So we've tried that in residency programs, in pediatrics, internal medicine, family medicine for 20 years. I've never had someone come up to me and say, no, the patient said, no, not interested. Not interested in discussing it, okay? So it has a 100% effectiveness rate. Now, they may be ambivalent and say, well, yeah, I told them I'm interested, but you know, I'm not that motivated. But that language is what's recommended and is consistent with all the recommendations. So I use the word weight. You don't use the word fat, obviously, or obesity. You talk about achieving or maintaining a healthy weight. You express your concern. Notice that I inserted only medical issues. Never, ever, ever talk about the cosmetic benefits of weight loss. And I've said this, I think, I don't know how many times. The most egregious example was at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh about 10 years ago when an endocrine fellow told a 16-year-old boy, I, I observed this, you'd be much more likely to get a date for the prom if you, got to, if you lost weight. I will never forget the look on that kid's face. Um, that encounter was over, by the way, okay? Never go there. It's none of your business, to be honest, okay? Your business, with respect to this, is diabetes. You don't say things like, you'll feel better, you'll look better, you'll have more confidence. They, hit, they get that message all the time outside of it. We tried that message with this group, and they said, that's fine. That works for African-American women just as, it, well, just as well as it does for other populations as well. So that is one of those things that, that I think comes through it. Now the food industry stuff is very, very, um, I think some people spoke very passionately, Larry, if I remember about the food industry. Yeah. I'm very passionate, I've been an advocate. Um, I have a target on my back from the soft drink industry going back many, many years, <laughs> as some of you know. Um, but I think that Framing this in terms of food justice is a really important thing. We started this back in Pittsburgh, actually, about 15 years ago in East Liberty, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, is not too far from here, um, and is an economically challenged area to some extent. And it's interesting that when you speak to community leaders and you say, you guys have lobbied successfully for public housing, better housing, better public transportation, better schools, why is McDonald's in your neighborhood? So food justice has many definitions. At the highest level, it means having food that is organically sourced and sustainable, and of course costs an arm and a leg. And for people like us, maybe that's fine. But to, to me, the new definition of food justice is you know, having the courage to turn down some of the unhealthy items that are being sold, okay? When I worked at the University of Chicago, they were very proud of opening up a Whole Foods in Hyde Park you know, on the south side of Chicago. It was wonderful, wasn't it? Bringing fresh produce to uh, an underprivileged community. The only people I've ever seen in there are professors from the University of Chicago. Right. That's, that, that doesn't work. So it's actually 
as we say many times, it's not what you eat, it's what you don't eat that matters. So we are trying to reframe food justice, and that resonated as well with this particular group. Um, there was a lot about accessibility of uh, treatment, and also uh, uh, accessibility to medications. Some of you may have heard there's a new medication called Wagovi that's out there, $1,400 a month. Um, they're giving it away free, almost free, for the first six months, but it's, it's oversold, it's outsold. So there, there was a lot of concern about that. Access doesn't just mean physical access, but it's having someone who can hold your hand. So we have peer support models, for example, that feature African American women in the same circumstances that are moving forward. So I'm gonna stop here right now and see if you have any questions, but I'm going to be speaking, I think, tomorrow as well. But I really would, in, 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 want you to be engaged in this effort as we move forward, regardless of what your patient population is, because I think this can be a model for a lot of other problems as well. So thanks very much. Any questions? We have about five minutes for questions. I guess I do have a question about like sure. food deserts. My name is Michaela. I'm a medical yep. student here. Um, just food deserts in general, because we have a couple areas by us where there's a gas station. It isn't necessarily even a fast food, but there's no other convenience store, general store they can even get any. Yeah, so th there's a lot of talk about food deserts, and a very controversial study from 2012 in the city of Chicago that said there aren't really any food deserts. Two reasons: people don't usually shop for food where they. Um, live necessarily, and things are available. Um, it's unfortunate that anyone know what the three biggest drivers of what you eat are? What what determines what people eat? Number one is accessibility, like no. how fast you need it. Well, that's a good, yeah. That's number two, convenience. Yeah, taste. It's the taste. It's the taste. It's the mm -hmm. taste. Right? Taste, convenience, cost. Where is nutrition? Does anyone know? <laughs> Very far down the list. And you know, people often ask me, well, that's, you know, if, if, these, if these poor people, and it's not an ethnic thing, you know, poor people in rural areas have lots of rates of obesity, if they would just eat healthy, if we just gave them healthy food, they would eat it. Uh, that it turns out not to be true. And then people are like, well, that's just, you know, they're not taking their health seriously. Here's an experiment, so it, a thought exercise. If you're at this conference, imagine your favorite dessert and it's a buffet line, and we don't have that because of COVID, but it's a buffet line, your favorite dessert is next to something that's like, you know, I don't know, broccoli, right? As a, as a broccoli with a little sauce on it as your dessert. Can you honestly tell me that you're gonna go through that line, you're gonna pick the broccoli? No, you're not. Why do we expect our patients say, well, if we just gave you, why aren't you eating the healthy food we gave you? Why do we expect them to do it? We're not programmed to do that. It has to be through public policy, or it has to be something else. Everybody responds to taste, convenience. I mean, you're right, speed is really important for us, right? And then the price is number three. Um, fast food is actually quite expensive compared to other alternatives, but people still eat it, especially lower income. Any other comments? Uh, yeah, go back first. When are you speaking tomorrow? <laughs> I'm sorry? I when, when are you speaking tomorrow? Uh, I think it's 9.45, right? No, all I can say is check for apps. <laughs> yeah. I just show up and go where I'm told. <laughs> I think it's in the, it's the morning. Yeah. So I'm glad you uh, mentioned, you know, kind of the medical I'm concerned about your weight and the health consequences. It answers uh, okay. One of my questions coming in is, as a white physician, yeah. seeing an African American, a, a black woman or man, mm -hmm. and I'm thin, you know, yeah. how do I... Um, yeah, great, great, great points, right? So, um, a couple of things that we, when we talked to this group, and I've talked to them privately, I said, well, would you hear that same advice from someone who doesn't share your profile, right? You know, when I, was, when I was putting together this group, I had friends, African-American men, who were experts in obesity. And I said, you know what, hey, we've got this person, this person, these are all leaders in the field. And people, there was a little pushback. I said, no, I don't think we want those people so much. And, and there was some concern that they would be being judged, for example. 
But then we, when we went into this, this group and said, well, you know, I'm not an African-American woman. I'm going to use this approach. Is that something that's acceptable to you? And the answer was invariably yes. If it is delivered the right way, and if it's put into a medical context especially, okay, that's the important, that's the key piece of it. I'm concerned about you because it's making your diabetes worse, because it's going to put you at high risk for heart disease. Are you worried about that too? So the weight is something that is a driver of something else. It seems to be perfectly acceptable. Yes. Dr. Roger, tomorrow, 945 at Rivers. Okay, thanks, Jason. I have a family doctor, and I've been working the last few years with a bunch of elders who are worried about their memory and very willing to adopt a diet and exercise program because those things can make their memory better and they are losing their memory and very worried about it. So it's very much like the lady that you mentioned who came in crying because her mom had died of diabetes and she didn't want uh, to deal with that. These folks have seen their parents die of Alzheimer's disease and they come in and say, I don't want to go through that. Tell me what to do. And we're about two years into it, and they're incredibly still motivated to do very hard lifestyle changes because they've seen it up close and personal, what it does to somebody's life. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. So Dr. Castor, who's in the corner, and I practice in the same place. And it kind of breaks my heart to see so many people in wheelchairs who are so debilitated in our waiting area. One of the term that resonates most with this population is diabetes and all its associations, kidney disease, amputations, blindness, heart disease. Um, I don't know of a single family that hasn't been touched by it. And so it's a very, very powerful motivator for, for, for our population. Okay. I think uh, just about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much.